Well, good morning. We are in Baptism Sunday. You've told them, right? I have. Okay. You, did y'all catch that? Did Greg mention that once or twice? <laughs> we got a baptismal out. We got towels laid out over the show. Uh, first service, I don't know how many people, a parade of people jumped in that water to show that their life had been transformed, to be an outward display of an inward reality. It was really exciting. So we're excited for what is yet to come today, and yet what we're talking about today is obedience. We're in the middle of our Wise Up series, these vignettes, these lessons um, from the life of King Saul that are teaching us uh, what not to do. Wisdom is knowing what not to do. And so as we look at the life of King Saul, we continually come across these lessons and these ideas of who we are and who we are to be as followers of Christ. And so if you will turn with me, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 15 today. If you have your bulletin, you can pull out the notes page, and on the back, the scripture is there, and we'll also have it up on the screen if you want to watch that way. And so what we're talking about is obedience. And what you need to know as we launch into this vignette, this little picture of scripture today, is that uh, Saul, the king, had been uh, told to take his army, and basically they're going, um, and they're going to wage war, right? And yet the word from the Lord through Samuel was that they should destroy everything and take nothing. Don't bring anything back. Don't um, just destroy it all. And this is a little bit of an odd thing to to tell somebody, but it's what was said, and so therefore it's it's what um, he is to do. Okay, can y'all come over this way for a second right quick? Y'all hear that? James, Claudia, and... He's now muted. (laughs) Greg, we can hear you. Um, (laughs) What was he talking about? Um... And so he's supposed to go and wipe the fullness of these people out. And so we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 21. King Saul is speaking to Samuel. And as he says in verse 20, he, 21, he says, But the people, his people that he was leading, they took some of the spoil. So they had defeated uh, the opposing army, but they took some of the spoil. Uh, sheep and oxen, the choices of things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. So he's saying... Yeah, I know you said not to take anything, but we took something. The people did. And Samuel says, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Samuel responds by saying, That's not obedience. So you brought things out and you disobeyed, and in doing so you said, But I'll make it better because I'll make it a sacrifice, so then it's all going to be okay. So he continues, he says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed, the, and, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. What is he saying? He's saying rebellion, it's, insubord- it's, it's cosmic insubordination. Disobedience, we think of sin and we go, oh, little one there, there's little ones, there's big ones, as long as they're little. And God sees sin as cosmic insubordination, cosmic rebellion between us and him. It says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. So Saul had been instructed in war to destroy the enemies entirely, not to take a spoil. He clearly did part of that, but he ignored the rest. Obedience is therefore then faith on display. Obedience is faith on display. What Samuel says is obedience is better than sacrifice. Saul built altars and they sacrificed these animals, and yet the word of the Lord is that obedience is better than sacrifice. What I get out of that, I pull out of that and extrapolate into our world, and I say sometimes doing the right things for wrong reasons becomes wrong things. So in the Old Testament, a sacrifice to God was a good thing. To, to take the choice fatted calf, to take the spoils of war, typically that, to, to give the best and lay it on the altar and sacrifice it to God was an offering of abundance. And God would have taken that as a good thing. But the, the prescription here was not to do that, and yet Saul did it anyway. In a sense, he's doing a right thing in his culture, but he's doing it for the wrong reasons, to somehow appease the fact that he was disobedient, and therefore it becomes a wrong thing. A lot of times we have good ideas, things that seem like they're right things, but when we do them with improper heart motivation, they're not right things at all. God sees through to the heart is one of the messages of the the book of 1st and 2nd Samuel, God sees not as man sees, but God sees through to the heart. It's not about externals is what we're learning over and over, week after week, that God is not worried about externals. 
God is worried about internals and knows that externals take care of themselves when the internals are worked out rightly. And so what we see in Saul is he has a, a disobedience that's anchored in fear. Verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I've sinned. He recognizes wrong, right? I've sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words. Why? Saul says, because I feared the people and I listened to their voice. Disobedience is anchored in fear. He feared the people. He didn't fear God. He feared the people. He was worried about what the people might think if he said this thing that was a little bit counterintuitive. Therefore, he was swayed by the people into wrong things. How often do we disobey God fearing what others might think? How often do we disobey God because we fear what others might think? Proverbs 9.10 says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's not a lightning bolt sending Zeus in heaven. That's not the picture of God. The, The word for fear when it relates to God in the Bible is reverential awe. That having a reverential awe, that seeing God as who God really is and getting a sense that we are this tiny creation by this incredible, omnipotent, omniscient, whoa, that's the fear of the Lord. It's going, whoa, that's legit. It says that's the beginning of wisdom. And yet what Saul is operating under is the fear of others and what they might think of him. 1 Samuel 15, 30, then he said, I have sinned, but please honor me now. Honor me now before elders of my people and and before Israel. Go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So, So he thinks he's sort of getting it right. You know what? I have sinned. And yet what is his desire? Before he can go back and and worship with Samuel, before he goes and makes amends for it, what's his purpose for it? Honor me. He's still worried about what people are thinking about him. He's still worried about what others might see. And his obedience, it can't be he can't be obedient. He's, he's disobedient primarily because he's worried about others instead of worried about God. So disobedience is not only anchored in fear, but it's in a self-serving attitude. Because what he wants more than anything is for others to see him a certain way. Not to have proper posture before God. See, if you look at it on a continuum, there's God, and then there's us, and then there's others. And when our focus is on others, the posture we worry about is how they see us. And what Scripture is trying to get through to us over and over throughout the totality of the text is that the ultimate thing we should be worried about is not how others see us, but how God sees us. It's not our posture to others, it's our posture before Him. Knowing that if we're right with Him, this stuff works itself out. The evidence of Scripture is that God cares more about the internal state than our external presentation. He cares more about your internal state than your external presentation. So many of us live in a a world of fear. We fear doing wrong. And so we live our lives in fear, avoiding wrong. If I just don't do this, or if I can just cut out that, if I, if I, any, and so our lives are focused on the wrong thing, focused on the sin, focused on the habit, focused on the area, the stronghold of life where we're struggling. And as we focus there, we do everything we can. We pour all of our effort into avoiding wrong things. And yet, that's us having an, a horizontal posture when a vertical posture is what God is asking. That's us worrying about the externals without the internals. If I can just avoid wrong things, and what, what the Scripture seems to be telling us is that if we, if we would simply prioritize and focus on right things, the wrong things take care of themselves. I often ask uh, young men doing premarital counseling, and so I'll be gentle about how we get here, but they'll say, well, you know, with lust, how do you, how do you avoid it? Like, what, what do you do? And I say, when's the last time that you tripped over lust in the middle of prayer? Yeah, yeah, not very often, actually, right? Right. How often do you trip into prayer when you're uh, knee-deep in lust? Yeah, not very often. When we focus on the sin thing, we very rarely get to the right thing. When we focus on the right thing, the sin things tend to be worked out over time. When we focus on God and our relationship with Him, when we focused on Christ 
and the story he tells of who we are, how we were lost and now we're found, how we were rebels. We were dead in our transgressions. The scripture says we were enemies of God and yet he loved us enough to send his son to rescue us. Drowning in our sin, he rescues us. When we focus there, all the little bits and pieces, the sins and stumbles all around us, those things tend to work themselves out. Yes, there are strategies for that, and yes, there are things to do and not do, and all that is true. And yet, so much of obedience is about focusing on the right thing. So much of obedience is about having a heart that is tied and focused on Christ. And if our eyes are on Christ and not on sin, what we see and the evidence of those around us is that tends to work itself out. So if fear is in avoiding wrong, then faith is in chasing Christ. True faith and true obedience are expressed in love. They are external displays of inward realities. External displays of inward realities. A lot of us have obligated obedience. Pastor Jeff says that, um, something about obligation, I don't remember what it was. It's very good though, okay. (laughs) I remember. Obligation obscures motive. The first time he said that, my mind kind of melted out the side of my head. And I said, what? And he says, obligation obscures motive. Which is to say this, I got little girls, right? If they're obligated to clean their room, you will clean your room. How do they clean it? Under obligation. And obligation is obscured motive. I don't know if they actually wanted to clean the room, but she just goes to clean the room. Does that... Does that do anything for me? She does it to earn um, my love. She does it as much to avoid the punishment. She's obligated. She has to. Occasionally, on her good days, she cleans her room out of love for me. She knows it matters to me, and so instead of out of obligated obedience, she does it out of obedience that's rooted in trust and love. And so instead of doing something to earn my favor or to avoid my punishment, she does something simply to love me. That feels different to me as the father. And the same is true of us. If we are living a life of obligated obedience, I don't do these things because the pastor said I'm not supposed to live like that anymore. God's going, what's that about? That doesn't, that doesn't warm my heart that you're like, you know, white knuckling it through life trying to avoid these old sins. What God wants is a heart rooted in love and that overwhelmed in love, you'll be full and overflowing. But you have to be tapped into the source to do that. And if we're living a life of religious obligation, there's no love there. And what we're attempting to do is to either earn God's favor or avoid his wrath. And if that's what we're doing, then Jesus came for no reason. The reason Jesus came is because we could not earn his love and we could not avoid his wrath because our sin had taken us to a place that we could not recover And so he sends his son, and his son is the Savior. And through him, we have new life. It's the whole difference. We, as believers, instead of living an outside-in faith, which is what the world will tell you to do, the self-help book gets the outside right. And maybe the inside can heal. And what the Bible says to do is get the inside right, and then watch the way that it regenerates everything on the outside. We live an inside-out faith in an outside-in world. Scripture in Galatians 2.20 says, we have a new life, we are a new creation. It's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. Which means it's no longer I who lives, we're dead to ourselves and we're alive only in him. We are saved not because of obligated obedience. We're saved because of love. Because while we were yet sinners, he died. Because God so loved the world that he gave Jesus to redeem us. And then the scripture says that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Which is the picture of baptism that we see today. It's not obligated obedience. It's not get in here so you can earn some favor with God. It's not have your story told and on display for the world so that God won't have wrath sent down upon you with lightning bolts or for us in this area, um, golf ball sized hail with jagged pieces all over it, right? I'm getting a new roof, though, y'all. That's not what this is about. This is not obligated obedience. You don't get any, there's no favor. When you get out of the water, 
and you go in the back, there's no prize. To show and be obedient out of love for the Father is what we're after. That's what God's after. God's after his children who will do the right thing out of love, not the right thing out of obligation. And so in our first service, we have person after person show us the picture of what our faith is. Buried with him in baptism, a person symbolically under the water, buried like Christ, and then raised up in new life, raised into the Christ life because Christ defeated death. We now live in his life. We share in his life and his inheritance. And so the picture is going down in death with Christ and rising up in life as he lives eternally. That's all it is. And yet that's not all it is. What a powerful picture of what's happened in this room. What a powerful picture externally shown of what's happened internally. And we said it's not about externals, which is the irony of having a baptism day when we're saying it's not about externals because it's an external display. But if baptism for you is an external display, then don't do it. If it's an external display of an inward reality, then man, today is a day to go put on those shorts that they got set aside, to put on that shirt that says, you know, I got a story. And to jump in the water and you are the sermon. I was once and now I am. I was once, I say it all the time, I was a force of destruction for all who knew me. I was selfish and self-centered. I lived about myself. The world revolved around me and anyone who wasn't on board with that fell in my wake. And I did it with a smile, and people thought I was nice. But I was a force of destruction. And then Jesus entered into my life. And all the things I had been raised to do, I was raised Catholic. I was baptized as a baby. I knew what to do and what not to do, and I spent my whole life trying to do the right things and not do the wrong things. And where I landed was unfulfilled and unsaved. And Jesus came, and the word from the Scripture was, You can't earn it, son. And I went, oh, now we're talking. When I realized that faith was a gift, I gave my life to Christ. And I said, I, I can't earn it, so you're going to do it for me. And the scripture says he already did. Jesus has already done it for us, and it's up to us to simply accept the gift. So I did. And as life starts to change, I see that I was a force of destruction. And all of a sudden, now I am. A little different every day. Living a life to make God known. Living a life to see the oppressed rescued. Living a life to see injustice remedied. Living a life to see the least of these minister to. Living a life that on some level might say, with my external presentation, the world might think maybe there's an inward thing that happened there. Because that's not normal. I like to say I went to the Caribbean on vacation when I was four. My parents took me to Cancun. My whole family went on a family trip. I got the sum total of my memories. I have it on the screen for you. Here's my memory from that trip. That's a postcard from 1984. I don't remember anything. It was done for me. They took me on a trip. They, they did it for me, and I don't remember a thing. I got a matchbox car. I remember that. Last year, my wife and I celebrated our 10th anniversary. We saved up some money, and we said, we're just going to do this. Let's, let's go for it. We went to Jamaica. So my second Caribbean vacation looks like this. I did that one. That was me. And I remember everything about it. I remember the way the sand felt under my toes. I remember the way the dinners tasted. I remember the look of the hotel room, the smell of the lotion in the bathroom. I remember every last detail. That, that's a sweet memory for me. The first one was done for me. I have no idea. doesn't mean a thing. That one, I keep that one. Some of you in this room were baptized as babies like I was. When someone sprinkled water on your head and said some holy words, your parents had great intentions, and yet someone did it for you. And perhaps you're in a place today where you said, you know what, I had that done for me when I was little and I've never made a choice to do that myself. Maybe today is your day to say, you know what, I'm doing this one for me. 
Because baptism is not about a ceremony, it's about an act of obedience from a believer who says, I want my story on display for the world to see that I was lost and now I'm found. And so Greg and the band are going to come out, and what we're going to do is we're going to baptize some folks, old school. We're going to act like Baptists, unashamed. So if you guys want to dance, you be careful, we're Baptists today. (laughs) Maybe you're in this room and you've never exchanged your life, you've never said, I surrender my life and I think... I think this Jesus thing is true, and I want, I want God to save me. I want Jesus to be my Savior. You have that opportunity today. Man, if you're like me and you spend your whole life trying to earn it, only to feel like I never can quite get there, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whoever should believe would not perish but have eternal life. Today is your day. That eternal life is yours to have. Salvation is yours to know. And it doesn't require you to do more things. It requires simple belief that Jesus is who he says he is, did what he said he did, and came to redeem and rescue you. If you're in this room and you're already a believer and you've never been baptized, Greg already said it. We got shorts and shirts. You go out those doors and we will have folks ready to set you up. We will have someone ready to put you in the water. And today can be your day that you own it. And so what I'd like to do is invite you to stand with me. We're going to sing a song. I'd like to pray with you before we sing. And then during the course of this song, after I say amen and Greg starts to sing, as the Spirit moves and as you feel led, those doors are open for a reason. That today can be the day not of obligated obedience, but maybe it's the first day of going, I want to act out of the love that you've placed in me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a good and a gracious God. And we confess, God, that we live so many of our days attempting to earn our salvation, attempting to work hard enough, attempting to be good enough. And yet, Father, you said you've already done the work. So, Father, as we have an opportunity today in our hearts to say, I believe, God, we believe whether for the first time or for the 500th time. Father, we believe in your son, Jesus. We thank you for sending him to rescue us, for taking away our sins and for giving us new life. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit, the gift we receive at the moment of belief that it might guide us in this world. And then Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move. That those in this room who need to take that step of obedience, not out of obligation, but out of love for you, Father, the Holy Spirit would move within them and they would be undeniably moved towards those doors. Not so that we can clap for them, although we will, but Father, so that they can look back. Having put on display what you've done within them and walk life under the joy of knowing that they are out and about, known to all followers of you. Father, we love you. We thank you for this place and this day. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.